So extremely recently, NASA Goddard released an intriguing simulation of a black hole. And to be more exact, a simulation of something falling into the black hole, basically helping us visualize what kind of effects one would experience as they approach these unusual giants. And though by itself this is a really cool simulation, showing us a lot of really awesome visual effects, in some sense it's also lacking some really important features. And so in this video I wanted to actually briefly talk about this, mostly because it kind of went viral and quite a lot of people have already watched this, basically focusing on what exactly you're looking at, how realistic this is, and most importantly, the things that are most likely not particularly correct based on the current understanding from a lot of different black hole ideas. Now don't get me wrong, this is still more or less correct, but this is an extremely theoretical simulation based on principles that basically involve infinity or singularity, while also involving certain principles that usually require something to have basically zero mass. And so in some sense all of this is awesome, super gorgeous, but a little bit simplistic. So yeah, let's discuss. And hello wonderful person, this is Anton, today we're going to fall into the black hole once again. And by the way, one of the first videos on the channel that went viral was basically this. Yeah, a video from like almost a decade ago was about entering a black hole in 360, just like this NASA video right here. So yeah, uh, cool NASA, you're only like 10 years late. Anyway, just joking. On a more serious note, one thing that makes this particular simulation super super awesome is just the accuracy of various gravitational lensing effects that we get to observe as this hypothetical camera falls into the black hole. And so here we're actually shown two different scenarios. In one of them we fall into the black hole, in the second scenario we kind of scratch the surface and then move away from it. But before I continue I wanted to focus on the most impressive part of all of this, and it's actually coming up right here. This is super cool. It might not seem like something super important, but this is one of the most important and one of the most fascinating features when it comes to studying modern black holes, and it's essentially known as the photon ring. There's actually a little bit more explanation about this in the video as well, but basically here you get to see these extremely thin layers of different images that in some sense actually show us multiple versions of the universe as it wraps around the black hole in the region where a lot of light gets trapped because it's essentially orbiting at the speed of light. And one of the coolest discoveries coming out of M87 black hole was actually a confirmation for the existence of these photon rings, or basically light that kind of gets stuck around black hole as it orbits many many times, to then maybe sometimes escape or possibly enter the black hole. Which is the title of that video I made previously 10 years ago, check it out in the description, ha 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 ha. Shameless self-promotion. Ok, back to the point. And so a few years back, researchers studying various supermassive black holes were able to confirm the existence of these unusual photon rings, because sometimes we actually get the same photon with pretty much the same information coming from a black hole at different times. And that's basically because the same information from the same part of the universe got stuck orbiting the black hole and could only escape after some time. And so in some sense, that unusual photon ring that seems to be present around pretty much all black holes is kind of like a direct copy of the entire information from around the universe, all compacted into these really thin layers, all with very different properties that are kind of visible in this part of a simulation as we approach the event horizon. And that photon ring is usually right above the event horizon, so that's kind of what we see right here. And to me personally this is super impressive, this is probably, at least for me, the best part of this whole simulation. With each of these successive bands moving closer and closer to the event horizon, representing slightly older universe or slightly older photons that got stuck around the black hole. But in this region there are actually no stable orbits, and so anything that reaches this point either gets to escape the black hole at some point or falls into it. So in essence you're not going to find some kind of an ancient light here, mostly because it's impossible for anything here to orbit for too long. Although in reality this particular simulation shows us a somewhat unrealistic black hole. Now technically what you're looking at here is based on Sagittarius A star, a relatively similar black hole to the center of our galaxy, 4.3 million solar masses, but very different from what it actually is. This is a non-spinning black hole. And this is also a black hole that seems to be extremely mild 
very quiet and essentially possesses an extremely small accretion disk. That's very, very far from what we actually observe around most central black holes. And most importantly, in the universe, everything kind of spins. We don't think non-spinning black holes exist. And as a result, it's not actually going to have these types of effects. For example, instead of having one photon sphere, a typical rotating black hole is going to have two photon spheres or two photon rings. And that's because a spinning black hole is also going to be dragging space around itself, with the closer photon sphere moving in the same direction as the rotation, but the farthest photon sphere moving in the opposite direction. With all of this changing even more, if you actually approach the black hole from a different direction. So in other words, all of this gets super complicated as the black holes start spinning. And we know based on recent observations, Sagittarius A star spins pretty fast. You can learn about this in one of the recent videos in the description. Either way, this simulation definitely showed us some really cool photon rings or photon sphere. But that's obviously not everything. Another cool part of the simulation is right here. Here we kind of get to see how the camera is approaching the black hole and, most importantly, we get to see the time dilation. Because this is such a massive object, as you approach this black hole, your perspective starts to change and you start experiencing time dilation different from the person outside of the black hole. And so technically, even though this camera takes approximately 3 hours to fall into the event horizon and it completes a single orbit in about half an hour, if, like in this simulation, it escapes the black hole, this camera is going to return to its original location 36 minutes younger. Which by itself is kind of mind-blowing, but is something we know happens all the time. This is actually really important for GPS satellites that do experience tiny, tiny, tiny time dilations, which affect their measurements and basically have to be always readjusted using atomic clocks. Now obviously GPS satellites orbit planet Earth and the gravity of Earth is much lower, but here because the gravity is so much stronger and because we approach the black hole so close, the time dilation is much more extreme. Naturally though, it's even more extreme in interstellar. And if you watch the movie, you know that there, for pretty much every single hour, the outside observer experiences years. And that's because, once again, in that movie, the black hole was spinning ridiculously fast. Kinda like real life. Now Sagittarius A star doesn't spin as fast, but we know that some black holes, like M87, do spin almost at their limit. And so that would be, once again, a little bit more realistic. The time dilation around those types of black holes is much more extreme. And then we come to the, I guess, the most important part, or maybe the slightly more controversial part. The part right here. The crossing of the event horizon. Now the reality is that this is a really cool simulation, but we have no idea what happens afterwards. This is just pure mathematics, and it's extremely unlikely to be real. As in, we don't actually have the math to explain what happens after the event horizon. The idea of singularity is obviously really cool, and in this simulation we actually get to kind of see what it might look like if you cross the event horizon and start approaching singularity, but most scientists today, the ones studying black holes, are pretty certain that this is unlikely to be like this. Mostly because they don't think we have theories yet to explain what's inside black holes. With the best potential explanation coming from the idea known as quantum gravity. The idea that's still not fully developed and that's currently at the forefront at possibly explaining everything. But it's just not there yet. And so pretty much everything up to the event horizon is definitely real physics. But once you cross the event horizon, we go into the realm of maybes, we're not sure, and possibly not real. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's mentioned in the press release for this is the idea of external observer seeing someone reach the event horizon. And basically, as the story goes, if I'm on the outside looking at you falling into the black hole, I would never actually see you reach the black hole itself and even see you cross the event horizon. In some sense, you would actually freeze right at the event horizon, because at this point, the space-time itself reaches the speed of light. And if I'm actually looking at you approaching the event horizon, in some sense you're also going to be kind of redshifting more and more and more. And at some point you might even completely redshift out of my perspective, becoming kind of invisible. And though it might be possible to maybe retrieve information about you at that event horizon, it would take an extremely long time to get any of this back. But once again, all of this is more or less kind of hypothetical, and most importantly, 
based on the ideas behind something approaching the event horizon with zero mass. And that's not what's happening here at all. This idea of particles never crossing the event horizon is once again kind of hypothetical and is just a kind of a textbook scenario. These massless particles potentially don't exist in real life, and more importantly, we know based on observations, things do cross event horizons and can be observed. And it's been seen many, many times when black holes collide. Here we know that this is a crossing of the event horizon where two masses combine together. With all this very likely happening because the tidal forces from these black holes actually end up stretching the event horizon so much that they both basically join in, combining into one. And something extremely similar happens to anything that has mass because they'll probably stretch the event horizon at least to some extent, making the event horizon eventually absorb them. Anyway, this is maybe getting a little bit too deep, but the point is that we know things cross event horizons, especially things with mass. But what happens afterwards is, of course, something nobody can answer. Or the one thing that's shown in this particular simulation kind of imagines what your perspective might look like once you're inside the black hole. You actually get to start seeing it right here. At this point, all of your spatial directions are going to be in one direction, downwards. There's no more up, no more left, no more right, just down. And according to the simulation here, it's probably going to take approximately 12.8 seconds once you cross the horizon before this camera gets completely destroyed through spaghettification inside Singularity. But honestly, at this point, time also doesn't really make sense anymore. Because once you're inside the black hole, a lot of things become really weird. I mean, once again, according to modern theories. For example, one idea suggests that your space and your time kind of switch. And so as you move towards Singularity, you're actually kind of moving toward the future. Whereas if you want to try to leave the black hole, you have to start moving toward the past. But even though all of this does get really, really confusing, once again, just to highlight the main point, pretty much after the event horizon, we don't actually have physics to explain anything. And so pretty much all of this, I guess you can kind of call this science fiction. It's actually based on physics that's not meant to explain any of this. Nevertheless, still a pretty cool simulation. By the way, in case you're wondering, the distance from the center of the black hole to the event horizon is approximately 25 million kilometers, or about 17% Earth to the Sun. And when the simulation starts, we're approximately 640 million kilometers, or basically 4 astronomical units, away from the center. And so in terms of mathematics of relativity, this is an amazing simulation, super accurate, and definitely presents us with a cool visualization. But in terms of, I guess, real life, that's where the story gets a little bit different. And so even though things like time dilation and gravitational lensing are still going to be very similar to what you see right here, in reality, all of this will look super different because First of all, black holes spin. Second of all, black holes are super active and usually have huge, huge accretion disks around them, very likely resembling some kind of a torus with a lot of matter around it, super, super bright, brighter than pretty much any star and producing so much more energy, which by the way is probably going to be the biggest problem when it comes to entering the black hole. I mean, here we're talking about basically flying through huge amounts of radiation and something resembling a super massive, very powerful star. And of course, everything after the event horizon, because that's where modern physics reaches its limits. Although interestingly, by studying supermassive black holes and by essentially observing the effects coming from them, researchers are hoping to finally be able to solve a lot of these mysteries of modern physics, including the most important of them all, the connection between quantum physics and theories of gravity, which is basically what all of this is based on. Here you're not actually seeing anything in regards to quantum physics, you're just seeing ideas behind Einsteinian theories of relativity. But as many scientists like Stephen Hawking have taught us, there are a lot of quantum effects around black holes as well, and they cannot just be ignored. For example, for all we know, as you fall into the black hole, because of Hawking radiation, you might actually start experiencing more and more radiation coming toward you, and as some scientists proposed, at some point right here at the event horizon, you might actually experience what's known as the black hole firewall, or basically anything that close to the black hole gets completely destroyed by enormous amount of radiation, mostly because of dilation effects mixed with Hawking radiation. But even this idea is not widely accepted, 
because once again, we just don't have enough information about black holes in terms of their relationship to quantum physics. And so one day, maybe in the next few decades, someone might finally find an answer to this quantum gravity phenomenon and finally explain black holes as a mixture of quantum and gravitational effects, which would definitely change how we imagine them using simulations and thus kind of invalidate what you're seeing right here. And so this is still kind of correct for now, but for how long we don't really know. The only thing that we're certain about is that, while well, black holes do seem to exist out there, they seem to produce just as much energy as we expect them to produce, mostly through the accretion disks, and up to the event horizon, all of the effects predicted by Einsteinian theories and the effects shown in the simulation seem to be more or less correct. Things like time dilation, gravitational lensing, and photon ring definitely exist. It's just we're not sure about everything else. But we'll definitely come back and talk more about this once there are some new updates, new simulations, new ideas or new propositions, or once someone actually explains everything all at once. And so until these future discoveries and future studies, at least for now, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.